Hi everyone, we didn't actually expect anyone to be here with all the other sessions that are on, so thanks very much for coming along. Um, I'm Katie Kennedy and I am a project manager at Auckland Museum and Lucy's my boss and we're going to talk to you about two projects that we've been doing, two exhibitions and some specific parts of them that we wanted to share with you today and as um, Virginia said we're really keen to have it a question and answer type session towards the end, mostly because it's the last session on the last day and we want to make sure that we keep you guys all awake. So one of our key questions, and I know it's a big one for everyone, but why choose the interpretive media that we do? Um, and everyone has their own goals and their own objectives and aims around this, but one thing that we refer to quite often, <laughs> for good reason, is our future museum document. So we have quite a few aims and goals within this, and we keep going back to that throughout the process. Um, I just wanted to share two of those with you. The approach um, around relevance and collaboration, the approach is based on what the museum's audiences have said they want. It gives visitors multiple perspectives on the museum's collections, their stories, letting them engage with the information at the level that they choose, from brief and intriguing to detailed and academic. And around access, we will tackle all barriers for people engaging with us, actively helping people move from non-users to confident museum participants. It's also all about creating connections, about considering the very best way to tell a story. It needs to be intuitive and accessible, and of course it needs to be within the budget that you have to work within. And as um, Peter said yesterday when he was talking, you need to focus on what is important for the end user. So the two projects that we're gonna talk a little bit about today are Moana My Ocean, and Hillary from the summit. So from the depths to the heights. So Moana My Ocean was open this year from 21st of June to the 28th of October. Um, it was an exhibition that invited visitors to become marine explorers and embark on a remarkable journey of discovery of their marine world. On their travels, visitors were to consider, or we hope they would consider, their relationship to the ocean and how they can play a role in reversing the damage being done to the planet. So it took visitors from the light to the dark, from the known to the unknown, from the familiar to the unfamiliar, starting at the Firth of Thames and going right the way out to the Kermadec Islands. So it was a whole project. We had um, a huge learning and engagement program that went with it. We developed the New Zealand Marine Life app, which is free and you should all download. And of course had a huge social media plan that went with it all. Um, it was a science rich exhibition focused on our collections and the collections of others. And it was, we based the exhibition around where the weight of the evidence lies. Um, we had 52 staff involved overall, 32 contractors, and an astounding and very, very humbling 130 individual scientists and organisations from all over the country and all over the world, including collection items that came all the way from Aberdeen. So Moana was the most popular self-generated uh, exhibition in over a decade. We had over 160,000 visitors in four months. It's quite a hard exhibition to explain in a snapshot, so I'm gonna play a film. Hopefully. <laughs> everything from life-size shark models to crazy looking things in jars. What I wanted to talk about today was a Hauraki Gulf boil up. So the phenomenon of aggregating fish under the water. This is what it looks like from the top and we wanted to give visitors an idea of what it looks like from underneath. We didn't want to do it using a film because you can't beat BBC. 
Um, and so we wanted to look at it in an interactive way that would give visitors a really good idea of what happens in our golf, in our space. So we put out an RFP for creative contractors. Um, we wanted uh, visitors to be immersed in the frantic and really exciting pace of a boiler and we wanted to be true to the science. So we wanted visitors to actually understand how the animals moved in the water, which is a pretty ambitious goal. Um, we had really, really clear objectives right from the beginning. So we wanted to provide significant visual and sensory impact, um, show the diversity of the golf, draw visitors into the space and hold their attention, enhance visitors' understanding about the Hauraki Golf and that the ecosystem is interconnected. And we were looking for a creative and effective response to convey how it would feel to be directly part of a boil-up. So I had some pretty big aims and goals around it. We also wanted it to be a story. A boil-up has a beginning, a middle and an end. So the small aggregating fish that are then encircled by bigger fish and then dolphins, sharks, and finally in the Hauraki Gulf, um, you're normally confronted by a brooder's whale, which is one of the most crazy looking whales you've ever seen. They have, I can't help but go into facts, that's how excited I get about this exhibition, but they have the same feeding um, pattern as we have left to right, so there's far more that swim on their right than do on their left. So after receiving some really, really amazing, ambitious responses, we decided to go with artificial intelligence. And with the help of our contractors and a flocking guru, which is something I really aspire to be now, um, named Rob, Robert Hodgkin, who lives in um, Brooklyn. So the idea behind flocking is computer sim simulations and mathematical code, which have been developed to emulate the behavior of flocking, and so the behavior of those fish and species under the water. Um, and then from there, uh, they worked with our team of scientists to develop an algorithm that would help show, well, that would get the fish to react in the right way under the water. Um, so they worked <laughs> for hours and hours with our scientists, going over and over the, the data, seeing all the ways that the fish could react differently. And in the end, um, we established a series of shapes, which you can see up on the screen here, that represented the different species. Each had a brain of its own, and each reacted in real time to the environment around it. So I'm going to show you what that looked like, just as shapes, because I think it's beautiful. This is a shark. beautiful and very mesmerising in its own right, but also could put people to sleep at three o'clock on the last day of the conference. Mm -hmm. Is that coming out of the no. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a bit. Good question though. And a lot of people were really, really interested on whether we were going to be able to show the objects or the shapes or the animals eating each other, or whether it was just they were just slowly going to disappear. Teenagers in particular. And I guess that's the other thing that I should have um, mentioned is the audience for this exhibition. We were aiming a family audience um, and a local audience, but also a specific aim for 10 to 14 year olds, which are always challenging to engage, but we had a huge amount of fun with it. So then we started looking at the renders, what animals we were gonna use, who, what we were gonna highlight as part of it. And we chose kingfish, gannets, kawaii, dolphins, bronze whalers, and brooders whales. I really want to watch you do that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and actually, this process took a really long time, um, though the ren renders there are really, really accurate. Um, and I think we went back and forward with the people designing them about 55 times. And we started getting scenes that looked like this. 
The final product in situ was a 270 degree immersive surround sound environment, including a voiceover explaining to visitors what they were looking at, what was coming, and how all the animals were reacting. And I want to play a shot, snapshot of that. Uh oh. So the voiceover you're going to see here, or the sound you're going to see here, is not the sound that is attached to the experience. first time that we saw this we were in a room with our science and curatorial team and we just watched it on repeat over and over and over again and everyone was pretty astounded with what we'd come up with and then being able to put it in an environment like that where people are seeing the fish come at them or the species come at them from all angles was pretty amazing to watch. As far as visitor response goes, um, the scientists were absolutely thrilled, which was really, really exciting for us because they shared so much of their knowledge and information with us. It was wonderful to see they were so happy with what we'd done. There was an average three minute dwell time in this experience alone, and considering that there was no seating in there, no des designated seating, we were really excited by how long they were in there for. It was pretty much every visitor's favourite part of the exhibition. and. Uh, those that were interviewed afterwards um, said that they did have a greater understanding of how a boil-up worked, why it was different in different places and how it was all interconnected, which we were pretty amazed by and very happy with. And of course it had a definite wow factor and you can't go past that. So now I'm just going to hand over to Lucy who's going to talk about Hillary. Thank you everyone. Um, I'm the Exhibitions Manager at uh, Auckland Museum. So I wasn't actually fully involved in delivering this project but I kept a very close eye on it. Um, and I'm really proud of what the team did. So I just want to make sure they get the credit, not me. So, um, so on the 29th of May this year, it was Hillary's 60th anniversary of the climb. And we knew we wanted to do an exhibition but we knew we wanted to keep it quite small and quite intimate and quite meaningful and about the journey and about the legacy of what he'd left behind, not just about did he get to the top or that sort of thing. So we created a very small intimate exhibition and I'm mainly going to talk to you about the process of creating the video map mountain, um, but we also did a lot of other stuff around it. So we also had a partnership with Radio New Zealand where we published the um, diary extract every day. So for a month you got, you heard his voice, well not his voice, an actor's voice. Um, we had pictures from children in Nepal who had sent them back to us, which we had on our website. We had the axe, we had the diary, we had the locket that he'd brought with the rock back from the top of the mountain for his mother. We had a doka and we had a prayer wheel, and that's about all we had. So we knew we had to have something that brought that all together, and that was the mountain. 
Um, and one of our big key things was that we wanted to, like Katie talked about before, remove barriers to engagement, like social, physical and intellectual. And by having a big 3D mountain in the middle that brought the journey home, we thought we were probably nailing that. So, I'll do a little bit of talk about the techie stuff. Um, we started with a 3D, a little model that we made. We used Google Earth Maps, well we didn't, a contractor did, to create a 3D model which was hand rendered and taken to a CNC cutter. And then it was layer after layer after layer after layer of plaster because we knew two year olds were going to climb on it. And we were sort of okay with two year olds climbing on it, we didn't want to stop them. So we wanted to make sure they wouldn't fall through. Um, then we used three projectors. We stitched the projection all around the mountain, hand plotted it all out. Took about three days to do that. Yeah, so they sat in the basement for three days and did that until they got it absolutely perfect calibrated and then we moved it up into the gallery. That being the end result. So that was at its all time, you know, brightly coloured glory, but we sort of needed to do that to see if it would get in all the shadows and everything in the right space. And then we went into the gallery space. And this is what, obviously, I've talked to you about the technical stuff, but obviously we had all the content interpretation going around that at the same time. And one of the biggest things we wanted to do was let people know that it was a team of people and it took a long time to get back up that mountain. They went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. So we visually showed people that and I'll just flip through some of that stuff now. So you can see the journey going up the mountain. The footage, the canal footage from actually the trip in the mountain. So you're actually watching Sir Ed and Tenzing climb the mountain. You're seeing the footage and you're surrounded by the acts that did it and the diary that he wrote in. So it's about bringing meaning to the objects, creating those connections to the collection items and making it accessible for everybody. And you could also dig as deep as you liked or be as brief as you liked. And did it work? Yep. It's like a diorama on acid from Janine Love, who's one of our exhibition developers. Um, and I can talk a lot more in detail than that, but I actually I want to make sure Jennifer gets your time in the sun as well. Um, do you want to talk about lessons learnt now? Yeah? Yep, we can talk about lessons learned at the end if you want. Cool. That's it. Jennifer. <laughs>